So what I have here is some, when you're thinking about these different so pots of revenue, what are some of, your, what are the, some of the considerations that you might want to think about if you're thinking strategically about revenue? So one of them is the size of the res revenue opportunity. I mean, if you're going to think about uh, raising money through additional fee, fee income, well, what's your likelihood that you'll actually have a sizable increase in that fee income? Um, um, and so you have to kind of, when you're evaluating these resources, you have to think about, well, what's the potential um, size of the, the amount of money that I can get from that, that, that resource? One is the sustainability. Is it a short-term grant or does it provide long-term support? A lot of grants are, are short-term, um, you know, um, and, and increasingly difficult to find longer-term operational support, although part of the... Um, uh, part of the impact investing movement um, has been that um, uh, to create partnerships between uh, funders and the non nonprofit organizations that can that can provide operational support over a longer term basis and allow the allow um, the the two partners the found, the funder and the nonprofit to to be able to partner for long enough that you would actually be able to have an impact on the particular issue that you, the, that's the focus of the partnership. Autonomy, you know, again, one of the, if you're taking the long view of resources in the nonprofit sector, uh, meaning, the, you know, from 50 years ago to today, there's been a shift to more restricted funding. Government certainly has gotten much more restricted in terms of their funding. Um, and many private funders have also become much more focused on project-related funding than, than, they, than they had once been. Relationship to mission, how does a resource opportunity fit with the organization's mission? This um, you know, certainly comes into play with government funding, particularly government funding being scarcer. It's, it's not uncommon for, say, a certain type of, say, social service organization to be offered a, a government contract that may be completely different than what historically the organization has been doing, but is, is tempted because the, the money provides additional revenue into the organization, but does it really fit with the mission of the organization? And then this cost of raising revenue is important. In, in one way, the cost of raising individual donations has gone, has gone way down, right? With the advent of online giving, I mean, when I, again, when I, again, when I, 30 years ago, used to have to mail letters to people and follow up with postcards and phone calls and, you know, the, the cost of raising money with the digital revolution has, has, got, has, gone, has gone way down. Many nonprofits are, have, have also become um, very involved with various kinds of special event fundraising. Um, any of you, and I'm sure many of you, have been involved in, in organizing these special events here. Um, oftentimes, it requires a lot of staff and a lot of resources to make them, make them successful. Um, and so special event fundraising is a particularly good example of where one needs to think about how you, what the cost of raising money is and, and how much money are you likely to raise for, for a particular event. This ties into the point I made before about certain grants and contracts are quite restricted, and this makes it uh, often difficult to fork, fund core operations, and so um, including overhead and infrastructure. So, if you're another important issue, if you're working in the plural sector, is how do you figure out ways to um, cross subsidize your core operations, particularly your infrastructure and your inf administration? So. Um, um, there are ways of doing that with building in your overhead and infrastructure into grants and contracts, but it's, it's complicated. Overhead and infrastructure are absolutely critical for the nonprofit sector. That's also another reason why some of these alternative revenue sources, such as um, market-based income, have become attractive because it helps support your overhead and infrastructure. And again, unrestricted income, this is where unrestricted income is particularly attractive because it can help fund your core operations. Um, and, and I've already talked about the nonprofits that face constraints on their ability to raise capital, which is another reason why there's interest in some of these uh, impact investing and other um, uh, new initiatives. And then um, let me just make a, a few concluding points here. Um, I think that whenever you're thinking about your resource strategy, you also need to be thinking about planning and evaluation. Um, um, sustainable organizations require a short-term as well as a long-term resource development strategy. Um, again, if you think back to the slide, Henry's slide about on life cycle slide, 
the, the challenge that many nonprofits face is that they, when they get, they start up, there's often a lot of excitement and, you know, that they get a grant or they get a contract and there's a lot of excitement about moving forward and growing and, and there's not often a lot of attention to long-term planning at that point, right? But, but nonprofits should, even from the very beginning, be thinking about what their strategy is in terms of resource development because um, for the reasons that I've articulated already, nonprofits eventually are going to have to face those kinds of questions and the earlier those, they face those kinds of questions, the better they're able to develop a kind of sustainable model for the organization. Um, and then the evaluation of resource needs to be, needs to be an ongoing, is on an ongoing basis. Um, and then I think that, again, um, related to some of these uh, life cycle point issues is that sometimes organizations at the startup phase, when they get a funder from maybe it's a foundation grant or maybe it's government or maybe it's a, a wealthy donor, oftentimes the orientation is upward to the funder. Even if they're a community organization, they spend a lot of time upward to the funder and, and, and they don't do enough on an ongoing basis in terms of developing their long-term community support. Now, large organizations that have been around a long time, they've got a lot of community support. They have large boards. They've got a large, large cadre of volunteers. But it, I think something like this is particularly important for some of the newer organizations that don't have the kind of broad-based volunteer and community support that, um, that larger organizations have. And I think this is also particularly critical in this current era where, com where funding is more competitive and, and there's more attention to your outcomes. And to the extent that you can demonstrate, you can get the community engaged in your organization in an ongoing way, either through volunteer opportunities or board service or, or other, or, or through philanthropic contributions, I think is particularly critical. And, um, and then, uh, and then I, I think you also, and I've, I've mentioned this before in some of my comments, is that there also needs to be careful attention to the governance structure of the association because just as at the startup phase, many, organ many, plural or many organizations in the plural sector, they often have a board that's not strategically composed to sustain the organization over the long haul. It may be, you know, often the case, I mean, a classic example in the nonprofit sector is that an entrepreneur might start an organization and they, they, they tap many of their friends to help support the organization. And they all may be very committed to the cause of the organization, but as a long-term strategy that sustains the organization over the long haul, um, you, the organization needs to think strategically about who's on that board and the governance structure um, and the relationship of the board to the to the staff and the volunteers of the organization. So. Um